So here we are. We finally made it to the last chapter of John Dewey's Art as Experience, Chapter 14. This is titled Art and Civilization. And I've already read this quote in the last video. I'll read it real quick now, but uh, uh, you should review the next video because I'm not going to elaborate on it. We're going to jump in because there's a couple couple quotes we're going to see here pretty well uh, wieldy. Uh, you know, look at this one. Uh, so we don't have a whole lot of time to waste. I want to wrap everything up for Dewey in this video. So not only are we going to uh, uh, cover chapter 14, but I'll have some closing remarks, questions, you know, maybe some objections and thoughts, food for thought, uh, that sort of thing. So stick around to the end. All right, so here we go. Theories that attribute direct moral effect and intent to art fail. Uh, because they do not take to take account of the collective civilization that is the context in which works of art are produced and enjoyed. Matthew Arnold's dictum that poetry is criticism of life is a case in point. It suggests to the reader that a moral intent on the part of the poet and a moral judgment on the part of the reader. You know, Dewey does not like this. Okay, he's not he's not denying that, that art has an ethical effect, but that's not why the artist makes art. It's not the moral intention of the artist. It you know he says this fails to see or at all events to state how poetry is a criticism of life, namely not directly but by disclosure through imaginative vision addressed to imaginative experience, not to set judgment of possibilities that contrasts with actual conditions. A sense of possibilities that are unrealized and that might be realized are when they are put in contrast with actual conditions, the most penetrating criticism of the latter that can be made. It is by a sense of possibilities opening before us that we become aware of constrictions that hem us in and of burdens that oppress. Right, so for Dewey here, he's not again, he's not denying to us that there is some moral effect of art, but it's not some sort of didactic, um, you know, lesson. It's not Aesop's fable where, you know, the story is being constructed solely with the purpose of teaching you a moral lesson, right? The intent is to express something, right? It's, it's an expression. If you don't know what that means in Dewey's terms, you need to review the previous lectures. We talk about uh, what it means to express in his in his language, right? So for him, again, the artwork is not there to, you know, tell you, you know, this is what you're supposed to do. Be a good boy, be a bad boy, uh, be a ba uh, good girl. Uh, you're a bad person if you do this or don't do this, right? Uh, not to some set judgment, as he puts it. Uh, but it actually is supposed to contrast, right, with maybe what we're aware of and open up these new possibilities, right? We might, through science fiction, see a world that is not like ours and kind of question ours and think about, you know, why aren't we like this? Or maybe why don't we want to be like this? if it's a dystopian fiction or something like this, okay? Uh, and it's, this is a very direct, you know, the artist is giving you a vision. They're not telling you, hey, by the way, wouldn't this suck if the world turned out this way? You should not do this. No, 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 no. You watch the movie and you're like, oh man, it like stirs you. And it gives you this sort of, you know, it's, it's more of a pathos than the ethos. Maybe I should have put the word pathos here in the, in the slide it's instead, right? Uh, it's, it's more direct. It's not, it's not didactic like in the, in the way of like some sort of ethical treatise. It is, it is by way of communication that art becomes the incomparable organ of instruction. So it can teach us a lesson. It can teach us a moral lesson. It does it in a very powerful way. But it's, an, it's, a, it's, it's, it's not in the way that, that you might you know, it's by reading a rule book or uh, a moral treatise, right? But the way is so remote from that that is usually associated with the idea of education, it is a way that lifts art so far above what we are accustomed to think of as instruction that we are repelled by any suggestion of teaching and learning in connection with art, right? So we might not see like, well, how could an NWA album, you know, if, that, if this is indeed art, right? How is Scarface of the Ghetto Boys? You know, how is this, again, you, you, might, you might debate whether these are works of art, <laughs> but if they are, right, if they're effective, I, I would say, you know, given Dewey's theory, they really would be art for sure. In fact, art in the most uh, uh, real sense of the word. I, I'm not really sure Dewey would like that. He probably, you know, if he would have lived to see uh, you know, NWA and Scarface, uh, they might have been a little too in your face for Dewey. Um, 
but again, back to his point though, um, the, you know, listening to NWA album or Scarface album, you know, of course, you know, they, they might not, not every track, there's some joke songs, there's some kind of crude things they say about women, but when, it, when they're talking about, you know, life on the streets, trying to get by, you know, uh, you know, criminal activity uh, out of desperation, you know, fear and paranoia, you know, based on living in that environment. Um, these albums, you know, if you listen to the lyrics and you hear the sort of sound and, and, and the artistic expression that is, that is coming through, you know, through this, in, in this case, uh, the organ of sound, right, that our ears are hearing it, uh, this is a learning experience. This is a way that art connects us to, with something real. It's educational, okay? And it's not, our, it's not you know, the, the typical sense of what you might call education, but it's educa it, it, for, for Dewey, maybe it's even better than what we typically think of as education, right? The fact that we're repulsed by art as, oh, art can teach us? No, it's a distraction. You know, that's like Plato talking. Him and his, you know, imagination bad, imagination good, reason, you know, facts, numbers, qualities, those are good, right? You know, that's that's the platonic approach to education. But Dewey says, no, art uh, it, it, and the imagination, uh, these are good, right? So he says our revolt, right? The fact that we uh, have a tough time, uh, you know, sort of admitting that perhaps we have something to learn from Easy e and Ice Cube. Um, our revolt is in fact a reflection, he says, upon education that proceeds by methods so literal as to exclude the imagination and one not touching the desires and emotions of men, right? Again, another thing that Plato would want to banish from the academy desires emotions you know throw that out of school you know this is a, a still a still from the Pink Floyd movie The Wall if you're not familiar this is the scene where you know, the, 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 this is kind of one of the most famous songs you know we don't need our education yeah this sort of uh, critique of uh, the sort of sterile uh, you know, cookie cutter educational system that, 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 that is the public schooling, right? Uh, it's, it, it uh, sends the imagination out to the, to the uh, timeout box, right? Get out of here, imagination. Get out of here, desires and emotions. Strictly go by the rules, right? Uh, for Dewey, this is, not, um, this is not right, right? He's very opposed to this. He actually wrote a whole book, which he's more famous for. His more influential book is not this one. This, pretty, this is pretty influential, uh, you know, his aesthetics, but his uh, theory of education, uh, you'll find a lot more uh, secondary literature probably on that than on this. So we got this long quote coming up here. He says, the problem of the relation of art and morals, now we're talking about morality again, uh, is too often treated as if the problem existed only on the side of art. It is virtually assumed that morals are satisfactory in idea if not in fact, and that the question, sorry, and that the only question is whether in what ways art should conform to a moral system already developed, right? So there's an assumption that, hey, we have this, we have moral uh, uh, conventions. Those conventions are correct. You know, we all, we all know what's right. We all know what's wrong. You know, that, that's sort of the, 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 the attitude. And uh, art is supposed to conform to that, right? That's sort of the assumption. But Shelley's statement goes to the heart of the matter. Imagination is the chief instrument of the good, right? But I'm, sure, I'm not sure Plato would like this, right? But he's saying this, right? What, what's his argument? What, where's Dewey go, where is Dewey going with this? How is the imagination the chief instrument of the good? He says, it is more or less a commonplace to say that a person's ideas and treatment of his fellows are dependent upon his power to put himself imaginatively in their place. So you might imagine, you know, when you were growing up and you were being a bad person, maybe I remember one time I was working at, I was, used to work in a grocery. I was working at Whole Foods and I, I went to use the restroom and, and a father was in there with his kids and they had just made a, a mess. You know, they made a horrible mess in, in, in the dining area and he was embarrassed. So he took them out. He put them in a timeout. And, and he was talking to him and he said, you know, think about that person. You know, you guys had fun. You thought it was really funny, you know, throwing all that food around. You had fun. But think about all the hard work that, that person has to go through. You think they're laughing right now? You think that's good? 
yeah, I don't know. I'm not a psychiatrist. You know, somebody might say that's not a good way to, you know, I think it was effective, you know, and, and in fact, maybe I'm wrong. Again, I'm not a psychology expert. I don't know about childhood development, but you know, this is sort of understood that our imagination, our ability to understand where the other person might be coming from. Um, this is what gives us the ability to be moral, to have morality, to have empathy. Okay. He says, but the primacy of the imagination extends far beyond the scope of direct personal relationships, <clears throat> except where ideal is used in conventional deference or as a name for sentimental reverie, the ideal factors in every moral outlook in humanity and human loyalty are imaginative. The historic, so when you talk about ideas, right, not as like ideal as in perfect or as in, oh, that's ideal, you're just, yeah, being a cloud in the sky, but the ideal factors in every moral outlook and human loyalty, right? That the ability to have a moral outlook, the ability to have compassion and loyalty and commitment and connection with others, Dewey argues lies in our ability to use our imagination in, in, the, in what he's calling the imaginative. The, the historical alliance of religion and art has its roots in this common quality. Hence, it is that art is more moral than moralities, that's quite a claim, right? For the, for the latter, moralities, right? The latter are, are tend to become consecrations of the status quo, reflections of custom, reinforcements of the established order, right? You might think about to the, one of the earlier videos where I talked about the, uh, um, the unesthetic versus the aesthetic spirituality, right? People that go to church just because like, well, I'm supposed to go to church because that's what a good person does. And they're bored in church. They're sitting there scratching their belly and looking at their phone. When is this going to be over? Versus the person who goes to church who actually gets a intense spiritual feeling out of it, a fulfillment, right? A, a, a vibrancy of life. Uh, those are completely two experiences, okay? So he's saying that morality, if it becomes this sort of like, I'm just going through the motions, go here to be good or whatever that defeats the purpose so so in a sense art is our savior in this regard right i i'm using a phrase art is our savior that makes me sound a bit like nietzsche again i'm, I'm finding a few parallels uh between uh dewey and nietzsche but of course nietzsche i think is when he gets supposed especially when nietzsche gets to his middle and his later career uh he's he's a bit of a like a hardcore realist and you know it's like yeah like there's some beauty that comes out of it, but a lot of ugliness too uh, that uh, comes out of our, our our engagement with the world and 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 uh, and the aesthetics that we um, we create in response to that. But uh, you know, for Dewey again, uh, religion and art um, they are obvious. Uh, they're obviously aligned, right? There's there's an obvious um, similarity or common root to both of them for this reason, right? Um, the moral prophets of humanity have always been poets, even though they spoke in free verse or by parable. Uniformly, however, their vision of possibilities has soon been converted into a proclamation of facts that already exist and hardened into semi-political institutions. Their imaginative presentation of ideals that should command thought and desire have been treated as rules of policy. So they become stiff, right? They become sterile. They become, you know, just going through the motions. Art has been the means of keeping alive the sense of purposes that outrun evidence and of meanings that transcend the in indurated hab habit. Okay, so, you know, this is a pretty controversial claim. He's, he, you know, you might be offended by what he's saying in that last uh, couple lines, right? That, that uh, art is sort of a mean of, it's an art is a means of keeping alive uh, the sense of purposes that outrun evidence, right? So you can't prove and people are not going to find plausible certain religious beliefs, but because darn that sermon was so beautiful and that, that choir just tra made me transcend, it, it, made me, it elevated me to this other plane of existence, at least that's what it seemed like, uh, that that sort of is what's keeping uh, these otherwise uh, you know, nonsensical beliefs alive, right? Again, pretty controversial claim, don't mean to offend anybody, but uh, that's what he says. And, tend to agree but anyway so um again art and its relation to civilization right this is the title of the chapter right when social divisions and barriers exist where, wherever they exist practices and ideas that correspond to them 
fix meets and bounds so that liberal action is placed under restraint, right? So once these, these uh, you know, works of art that maybe were uh, very prophetic and, 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 and moved and stirred us spiritually, once they become institutionalized and once they develop into parties or, you know, uh, group identities or, you know, religious identities, whenever these social divisions occur, um, the practices that correspond to them uh, now become restricted, okay? And so that any sort of uh, rebellion or any stepping outside of these meets and bounds, as he puts it, is, is placed under restraint. So creative intelligence is looked upon with distrust. The innovations that are the essence of individuality are feared. And generous impulse is put under bonds that uh, not to disturb the peace. Were art an acknowledged power in human association and not treated as the pleasuring of an idle moment or as a means of ostentatious display, and were morals understood to be identical with every aspect of value that is shared in experience, the problem of the relation of art and morals would not exist. Okay, there's a lot to unpack in just that last couple sentences there, and he's saying quite a bit. Very interesting stuff, I would say, too. So what is he saying? He says, we're art and acknowledged power in human association and not treated as the pleasuring of an idle moment. And he, he wants us to do that, right? He wants us to acknowledge that it's, it's, it's a power of human association. Why, why, why does art work? Because it, it brings together a communal aspect of it. You can go back to my first lecture on Dewey to review that, right? The Parthenon was not just a beautiful work of art, but it was a symbol of civic pride. And it also served a function, right? And so if we understand art as a celebration of that, of a human association, the power of that, right? If we acknowledge it as that and not just some sort of pleasuring or idle amusement or, oh, that's fun. Let's go to the art museum and get, you know, uh, see some cool paintings for a day. You know, if, if we see it properly as he wants us to, right, as a part of the human association. And if we understood morality also as identical with all other kinds of values, right? In philosophy, we tend to separate aesthetics, you know, artistic values of beauty uh, standards of beauty and art, we separate those from our moral values. Those are different, right? You have a different class for ethics and one for aesthetics. And, and in economics, you might talk about economic market value. But for, for, for Dewey, and this is, I think, is where he is in, in totally in line with Nietzsche, whether he realizes it or not, uh, these are all values, right? They're all, they're all values and they're all sort of a, a part of the same thing, right? They're not really separate, as separate as we would like them to be. Uh, so if we know that, if we acknowledge these two things, right, that art is, um, uh, it's acknowledged as a power of human association, we acknowledge that, and that ethics and aesthetical values are just values and values are values, right? I mean, there's differences, obviously, we treat them differently, um, but they're, they're, they're understood really identical uh, in our shared experience. This problem would not exist. You wouldn't think about it. So what is he saying here? Here's my take. He's not super obvious about this, but I'm thinking what he's saying is when we look at art and we are disgusted by it, like we see a character in a movie that's acting disgusting. We're, this is horrible. This is a horrible, uh, you know, we, we, you know our, our, our kids are listening to the NWA album. And this is a, he's not a role model. He's a gangster. He's talking about shooting a man and evil, you know, and, and it's like, no, this is a reflection of your society. Okay. This is you. You should question yourself. Right. This is, you know, that's not to put the blame on you or someone in particular, but on all of us, right? Art is a reflection of the times. It's a reflection of real art is an expression. There's an underlying impulse. And through the medium of music or film or whatever, the artist expresses that inner impulse. And if it affects you and pisses you off, right, well, then you need to look in the mirror or at least look outside your window and look at the world around you and look at the civilization from which this art sprung, right? So to keep art separate from morality, like morality is this sort of like set in stone, you know, sacred uh, institution uh, that, that can't be challenged, right? You know, for one, it's our ability to use imagination. It's art that drives us to care and to have values and desires and passions. And two, um, you know, if, you know if, if we are 
disgusted by a work of art, uh, maybe it is just there for shock value, right? Maybe, 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 you know, some of this NWA stuff, you know, these guys were just there, you know, when they found out the FBI was, 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 was watching them and sent them a letter not to record, you know, easy. He's like, great. We're good publicity, right? We're going to sell a million albums, right? You know, maybe some of it is just shock value, right? Uh, but even then, I think you can make the argument that, well, why does anybody have the um, urge to just shock, right? There must be something in them that is, that is angry, right? There's something shocking <laughs> that they want to express. So to go beyond good and evil, right? That's a phrase, you know, maybe he did read Nietzsche. I'm not really, I'm not really that much of a Dewey expert in general. I, I've read this book several times and studied it a while. So I feel confident discussing you know, Dewey in, in this regard, but, and, and I don't know his biography. I don't know, you know, I'm sure he's read all his pragmatist. He was a pragmatist. So he was certainly influenced by purse and I'm sure he's read all the heavyweights, but you know, as I've said in previous videos, uh, uh, Nietzsche at this time in the thirties was kind of persona non grata in academia. So I'm wondering if, um, you know, Dewey is, knowingly using this phrase beyond good and evil as an allusion to Nietzsche's book of that same title. Uh, but nevertheless, maybe that's a distraction. Um, let's just read the quote, see what he has to say. I do think that it is um, uh, peculiar. It's a peculiar, sorry, it's um, there's a peculiarity to it uh, that there's a lot of parallels, I think, with the claims he's making here and a lot of claims that Nietzsche made, well, in The Birth of Tragedy, but really throughout, throughout Nietzsche's career. To be beyond good and evil is an impossibility for man. And yet, as long as the good signifies only that which is lauded and rewarded, and the evil that which is currently condemned or outlawed, the ideal factors of morality are always and everywhere beyond good and evil. Because art is wholly innocent of ideas derived from praise and blame, it is looked upon with the eye of suspicion by the guardians of custom. Or only the art is itself so old and classic as to receive conventional praise is grudgingly admitted, provided as with, say, the case of Shakespeare, signs of regard for conventional morality can be ingeniously extracted from his work. Right? So, you know, it's only when works of art you know, reach a point in which the status quo, right, the, 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 the peoples who were sort of the moral arbiters, the, the, the moral authority, you know, they they've made themselves the moral authority of society, the sort of censors of art. <clears throat> you know, when a work of art is uh, re re uh, received a status, right, maybe Shakespeare, because it's so long ago, and even the crude language, it's, it's, it's words that are so outdated that some of the words that might have been obscenity and offensive are not offensive anymore. Uh, you know, and we, and we could pull things from Shakespeare that fit into our conventional sense of morality as it is today, right? As it is here and now, right? Whether or not it's the morality of the 1960s before civil rights, right? You think about the worldview of people before civil rights in America as, as opposed to today and how perceptions have changed, right? What's going to be offensive, right? What's really going to piss people off? It's going to, what steps out of bounds of that sort of pre-established status quo right that sort of sterile custom this is what makes art sort of striking and, and all this um but of course the people who are in charge of the status quo you know they're all they're all they're more than happy to accept that accept works from which they can interpret some meaning that is in line with their own belief systems but art is not concerned so much dewey says with praise or blame and that is, I think, disputable. Uh, you, you need to talk to the artist, I, I would say, to, to know. Uh, does the artist really care about the praise and blame and criticism of his work? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, I know there's a, um, a popular assumption or a th theory amongst artists, intellectual types, that, 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 that good art, proper art, uh, really expressive and passionate art, is not taking into consideration the audience per se, right? They're just, they have an emotion, they have an intention, they have a vision, and they're trying to bring it to this artistic creation. They're trying to make it realized in an art product. It's the word that Dewey would use. Um, but whether or not they should be concerned with what, whether the audience is gonna like it, that is open for debate. 
but Dewey's kind of acting like, no, it's not. No, no. Artists don't, they don't care about praise or blame. That's not what they're concerned about. Right. And, and maybe he's right in the sense of morality. They're, they're not concerned about moral praise or blame, but they also, I would assume some artists, they want their movie, their painting uh, to be, if not well received, they want it to be at least appreciated by somebody, someone, or some audience. Okay. Then that might not be true in every case, but I would assume it's, it's definitely true in some cases. Maybe he's not completely right here. So this indifference to praise and blame because of preoccupation with imaginative experience constitutes the heart of the moral potency of art. From it proceeds the liberating and uniting power of art. So his point here is, and, and, and so maybe he, um, he could use this as an argument against somebody who denies him this, right? Somebody who quite like I just did, you know, well, may, maybe some artist and it's, you're still an artist. If you, you're concerned with the reaction of your public. Okay. Um, but he's saying, no, what you should be concerned with, you have an indifference to praise or blame. You're preoccupied with imaginative experience as he puts it here. So in other words, you have this imagine your, your imagination has this concept, this idea, this urge, this emotion, whatever it is, you want to express it. That's your focus when you're creating the work of art. And that's why you'll get pissed off at the producer. When the producer comes as you can't have that scene, people will get offended by that scene. And, and we won't be able to get an R rating or we won't be able to get a PG rating. And then the, the director has to be like, screw you. I don't care about the PG rating. I don't want the widest audience. I want a good work of art, right? Um, so that indifference for, uh, for Dewey, uh, that, 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 that focus on the, the imaginative experience and bringing it forth in the work of art, that's what gives art its moral potency. That's why it strikes us, right? The fact that Quentin Tarantino, when he makes this gangster movie of the bank robbers, right, the Reservoir Dogs, right, this is his first film, right, he's not worried about us, you know, getting offended by some of their off-color jokes or their violence, right? He's trying to show you this visceral, dark world of this gangster, right, this gangster mentality, right? It's a hard movie to watch for those of you who, 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 are, who are sort of squeamish when it comes to violence. Same thing with Do the Right Thing. I think that do the right thing is a film where there's not a that much violence like there is in, in reservoir dogs and by the way i think spike lee would probably want to kill me uh if he saw his movie compared to tarantino i think he kind of hates tarantino they have a famous sort of public uh, uh uh disdain for one another uh but i'm a fan of both of, of their works i think they both do good work no, not always not all their movies are that are great some are better than others but to me uh, do the right thing is spike lee's masterpiece i mean this is his greatest effort ever i just i don't see how he could ever outdo it it's it's not a perfect film it has its flaws but i think it has a moral potency because it doesn't preach right the title of the movie is do the right thing but it doesn't tell you what that right thing is by the end of the movie you become a, a very uh you, you know um uh, familiar with the characters and they grow on you. I think there's one, maybe one or two characters in there that, that I don't like that are really annoying. Uh, they're they're kind of off putting. There's like one or two, but the rest of them are kind of like, they have their differences. Some of them don't like each other. There's, they have their flaws, but you, you come to kind of develop a, a, a a connection with them you like them they're very they're very lovable they're very likable characters and then by the end of the movie there it gets it gets tense man it gets super tense you know there's a big i don't want to i don't want to give away the ending but man it's, it's a powerful it's a, it's, it's a comedy but then the last the last 20 minutes or so it gets dark and it gets serious man. and it, it hits i mean I'm, I'm starting to get goosebumps just thinking about that film i kind of want to go i kind of want to watch it again and to, to me that is effectiveness. And it's not, you know, and I think this is the problem to me with some of Spike Lee's later movies is that it's so obvious that he's trying to preach to you something. It's so obvious that he has an agenda, you know, that he's trying to promote some sort of political agenda. And even if you agree with his political agenda, you know, I tend to, to agree on a lot of things with him. It's kind of off-putting and it makes the artwork less effective, right? Uh, than I think his other films like, like Do the Right Thing. So to conclude, right now we're finally at the end of the uh, the chapter here. This is the last quote that we're going to read. Shelley, you know, he brings up Shelley a lot. Shelley said, the greatest secret of morals is love or a going out of our nature and the identification of ourselves with the beautiful, which exists in thought, action, or person, not our own. 
A man to be greatly good must imagine intensely and comprehensively. So that's a great quote from Shelley, which kind of sums up Dewey's point here, right? The imagination allows us to empathize with others, to set ourselves in another person's shoes, to as close as we can to feel maybe what it might be like to be them and to maybe build a bridge with that. The first intimations of wide and large redirections of desire and purpose are of necessity imaginative. Art is a mode of prediction not found in charts and statistics, and it insinuates possibilities of human relations not to be found in rule or precept, admonition and administration. So again, this is a point that he keeps reiterating. Okay. Sorry about that noise in the background. I don't know if you can hear it, but it, I, I guess it's trash day next door at one of the local businesses. I don't see where the heck the noise is coming from, but it doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. So I guess I'm just going to have to talk very loudly to wrap things up here. All right. So here we are at the end of our exploration of John Dewey and art as experience. Oh, it's so annoying. It's so distracting. Let's unpack this last part. Let me take a sip of water. Sounds like we're finally going to be, yes, finally drove off. That was a loud 18-wheeler. Very loud, right? It disturbed the aesthetic of this experience, right? To bring it back to Dewey. Um, okay, so again, the imagination, a necessary ingredient in morality and our ability to empathize with other people our ability to kind of try to feel the emotional uh, weight of their situation, even though we're not in it, right? So for him, it has that important function. And then also too, art, you know, through, through this ability of art to invoke our imagination, I think what he's sort of hinting at here is that it has the capacity for real good, deep social change and for opening up new possibilities, not of just social change, but maybe technological different modes of human experience. So art is a mode of prediction in that sense, right? It's not found in charts and statistics. We're not basing it on, oh, last year, these, these demographics did this behavior. And so this year we can predict that it's likely this percentage are going to do this. They voted for him in this year. So it's likely they're going to, no, no, no. It's prediction in the sense of, you know, here, here I am an artist amidst civilization right, with this, 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 this inner drive to express, right, and through this artistic medium, I express it, give it to the world for you to see, and it provokes thought, provokes imagination, other possibilities, right, other possibilities of human relations not found in rule and precept, admonition and administration, right, so, you know, for Dewey, this is the power of art, and this is what makes art sort of the highest human achievement that, that he's aware of, right? Uh, he doesn't even say that he's aware of. He, he makes that emphatically, right? One of the earlier lectures, right? So this is sort of what man has evolved up to, right? <clears throat> right? We use tools, we implements of war, and then we start shaking hands. We have this sort of like, you know, civilization, but then art is sort of like the crown of it, okay? How am I going to wrap this up, right? How are we going to do this? How are we going to conclude the video? I don't want to go too, too long here, right? I know I'm already like, uh, what am I, uh, let's see where we're at here over 30 minutes in, okay? So I'm gonna try to wrap this up in the next five minutes, okay? And maybe provide a little bit of a segue for Heidegger. I don't know if that's possible, but we'll try. So, um, you know, some of the criticisms I've had with, for Dewey so far uh, throughout the video, I think that, I, although I like his theory quite a bit, I do tend to think it's too broad, right? The way he defines art as the ability to you know, basically create an experience, to create a unified experience, okay? That might be too broad. It, it might, you know, it, it, in that case, if you go watch a really good sporting game, right, a sporting event, uh, or, or probably better yet, a boxing, right? That's a sporting event, but that particularly is a good one because you've got two, two people, and the way that they fight each other is so graceful, so artful, right? And the whole experience, the way that the stadium is set up and the way that the thing is promoted and marketed has a whole aesthetic to it. When you go see that that sporting event and you leave it, that's a work of art. That's a work of art for Dewey. And I think some of us would kind of shudder to call – going to see a boxing match, a work of art, okay? But maybe some of us do like it. I tend to like it, but I know that some of my snooty art friends won't. I like it, but I understand we're taking a class on the philosophy of art. 
art theory, aesthetics. And so, I mean, I think that, you, you know, there's this sort of expectation that we're going to be focusing on things like paintings and sculptures. And we're not going to be talking about sporting events or parkour. I was using a lot of uh, those really cool photos, those, those sequence photos of parkour, people jumping from building to building, right? These dynamic experiences where, you know, Dewey says there's this tension and obstacles and accumulation. Previous experiences are brought to the fore and our previous experiences inform our future experiences. And there's this overcoming and this accumulation and this discharge, right? Um, you know, all of this is indicative of a lot more experiences than ones that people would commonly refer to as art. Now, of course, what Dewey would probably say in response to me you might be thinking in your head is that's your fault and that's your modern prejudice, right? This is the result of what we talked about in the very first video, you know, this, the establishment of the art world by, you know, the creation of the art gallery as a sign of nationalism and imperialism and also this sort of uh, industrialization of art, you know, functions of the artist that used to be integral to society, you know, painting the bridge, you know, constructing uh, civic centers. This has been removed due to industrialization. And so automation has replaced what, what once made the artist a part of civilization. And now artists have become more and more individualized. So the fact that I'm pushing back on Dewey's theory because I think it's too broad, uh, he would say, well, that's just an effect of you growing up in a culture who has lost sight of really what art is based in, what the basis and function of art truly is. And if it doesn't move you, it doesn't sort of uh, uh, bring you together in this sort of communal uh, uh, experience of intensity, and equilibrium and unity, this almost sounds like Nietzsche's Dionysian, uh, but if it doesn't do that, it's, it's failed its purpose as art. It's not really art. It might be virtuosity, expression, or something like, uh, not expression, virtuosity, skill, or something like this. But if it's art, it has to express an emotion and something that can be understood and shared directly and immediately by the observer who enjoys it. So anyways, I better stop there. I think that's a good place to cut it, uh, cut it short. Um, covered a lot of material here. I hope you enjoyed what we did. Uh, thanks for, if you did watch all the videos, good for you. Thanks for sticking around to, to the very end. Uh, hopefully you have a much better appreciation of Dewey and maybe a better appreciation of art. Um, you know, again, this is one thing that just popped up really quick. There are certain art forms, I think, that are kind of tough to see how they work the way Dewey wants them to work. The painting, for instance. He uses painting in, in a lot of examples, but I don't see how going to see a painting at a museum is necessarily going to give me that tension that builds up and then that sort of aha, that sort of unity, that, that feeling of discharge, right? I, you know, that, that's something that you might think of, too. You know, how do you apply Dewey's theory to particular works of art? He doesn't seem to spend much time doing that, and that might be a shortcoming of this essay. But anyways, okay, that's all I want to say. That's it for now. Uh, next series, and it'll be a few days before I get started on this. I still have to get all my materials in order. But the last philosopher, the final philosopher we're looking at this semester in our course in uh, philosophy and the arts is Martin Heidegger. We're going to look at his, his very influential and infamous essay, uh, The Origin of the Work of Art. So we have that to look forward to, and I hope to see you on the other side.